quantifying light energy delivered to a class 1 restoration. Inadequate curing of resins results in the resin restoration not achieving the manufacturer's intended physical and chemical properties. By the end of this presentation I hope you'll agree that we have a problem, but I also hope you'll agree that we can do something about this. Resin restorations are not lasting as long as they could and should. Several recent studies of dental records have shown that amalgam lasts approximately 16 years, whereas resin is lasting only approximately 6 years. The unexplained resin restoration failures are a concern to both dentists and patients. In 2008, the European Commission Scientific Committee on Emerging and Newly Identified Health Risks reported that resins should receive 16 joules per centimeter squared. This is supported also by the Philips textbook. The hypothesis of this presentation is that resin restorations are not receiving sufficient energy at the appropriate wavelengths to adequately polymerize. Up until now we've just tested the output from the light, mainly using dental radiometers. The problem is that the dental radiometers are inaccurate with both inter and intra brand inaccuracies. Thermopiles are a more accurate way of measuring power but they have no clinical relevance because they do not measure the spectral output and thus the results that you're getting do not indicate how well the curing light will cure the resin restoration. This information can be obtained using an integrating sphere which measures both power and spectrum and gives an output in watts per nanometer. The trouble with both of these techniques is the irradiance is not uniform from curing lights. Here we can see an example of a curing light that has three LEDs in the head. We'll notice that in the middle of the curing light the irradiance is down to 388 milliwatts per centimeter squared. However, directly underneath the LEDs we can see that it's up to 5835. When the irradiance of this light is measured using an integrating sphere, we get an average irradiance over the entire tip of the curing light and this works out to 1300 milliwatts per centimeter squared. Now another problem with many studies that evaluate curing lights and the performance of curing lights is that they test them at zero millimeters when they are just not used at zero millimeters. Here we can see that a composite is a minimum of two millimeters from the end of the light guide in a posterior restoration and this distance may be as much as 7 millimeters in a class 2 box. Here we can see an example of irradiance over distance. At 1 millimeter, the, there is one light that's performing very well, the blue line, A. But once we get beyond about 5 millimeters, we see this light performs very poorly. Conversely, the light that performs the worst at 1 millimeter does the second best after 5 millimeters. So really we need to be looking at lights in the clinically relevant range of 4 to 7 millimeters distance. So the purpose of this study was to measure the energy delivered to a class 1 restoration by 20 dentists in a mannequin simulator using different curing lights. Now to do this we use MARC. MARC is a measurement system that is used to understand and manage the four variables that determine intraoral energy delivery. Here we can see Mark. It's a mannequin head and inside the head there is an Ocean Optics USB 4000 NIST reference laboratory grade spectrometer. That is attached to cosine corrector probes which are in the teeth in the mannequin head. Now the size of the cosine corrector probe is 3.9 millimeters in diameter. This is very similar to a class 1 restoration in a posterior tooth. Here we can see the cosine corrector probe in the mannequin head but without the shroud of the tooth that goes on top of this. Here we can see a dentist curing as a simulated restoration using a dental curing light and while they're doing that you're measuring the irradiance and the amount of energy delivered. The mouth opening in this study was fixed at 43 millimeters at the incisors. This is important to know because if you change the amount of opening then that's going to affect the access of some curing lights um, to uh, the restorations. 
Here we can see the results from the 20 dentists using first the Velo light. Now the Velo light was only used for three seconds. This is what the manufacturer recommends per increment, but we can see that with three seconds, five of the dentists delivered less than five joules of energy to the restoration. When we now look at the 20i used in the turbo mode for five seconds, again what the manufacturer recommends per increment, we will see that um, two dentists delivered over 10 joules and here we see that three dentists delivered less than five joules. When we look at the demi curing light, this was used for 10 seconds. Now the demi curing light, six of the dentists delivered more than 10 joules. With the G2 light, this was used on high power for 10 seconds. We see that 15 of the dentists delivered over 10 joules of energy and none of the dentists delivered less than 5 joules. So there's a wide range in the energy delivery from 0.7 to 13.6 joules per centimeter squared. Subjecting the results to ANOVA and Fishers, we see there's a significant difference in the energy delivered. Here we can see the results and you'll notice that the blue phase G2 delivered the most amount of energy but remember that was used for 10 seconds. The Demi, Blue Phase and Velo delivered equivalent amounts of energy. If we look at the mean time required to deliver 10 joules, we'll see that the Velo would only take 4.3 seconds to deliver 10 joules of energy. It's interesting to note that the power output from the lights was greatest from the Velo, the radiance was the greatest, but the energy delivered was uh, the least out of uh, all of the four lights but that was because the light was only used for three seconds. Now testing over a hundred dentists with Mark using good curing lights and recommended curing times, 10% of the dentists have delivered less than five joules of energy. There was a tenfold difference in the energy delivered between the best and the worst operator and interestingly both the best and the worst did not know how well they were doing. As a profession, we have had no idea how much energy we were delivering to a restoration because we just were unable to measure it. This is important because undercured resin does not deliver the manufacturer's intended physical or chemical properties. We're now going to look at a video showing Mark in action. Here we see the assistant curing the restoration. She's not watching what she's doing. Uh, she's not stabilizing the light guide and look at the screen you can see how the radiance goes up and down as she moves on and off the tooth. This technique delivered 6.2 joules of energy. Now we're going to see her paying attention to what she's doing. She's adjusting the light guide to maximize the amount of energy she can deliver. She's watching what she's doing and she's stabilizing. Looking at the screen you can see there's a very uniform constant irradiance being delivered to the restoration. It's almost perfect. This technique delivered 13.2 joules of energy to the restoration. So you can see by improving the technique we're doubling the amount of energy delivered. So I'd like to leave you with a few concluding questions. The first question is has your light curing technique been measured? Secondly, how much energy are you delivering to your restorations? And finally, how much energy does your resin really need? This research was supported by NSERC, Springboard Atlantic, Ivoclar, and Dalhousie University. The software was developed by 24-7 and Ocean Optics. Thank you for your attention.